First of all, um, I should say that uh, one aspect of American U.S. life and culture that I think does deserve uh, respect and admiration is uh, protection of freedom of speech. The U.S. is unique in the world in that respect, to my knowledge. And I think that's really important. Uh, next to freedom of thought, which is like a f fundamental uh, right, freedom of speech comes next. Everything else, I think, is secondary to it. Uh, however, it, you, should, you should recognize that freedom of speech in the United States, though it's, it is protected to a very high degree, uh, has not been protected historically. That's a recent development. And in fact, it's a development that came substantially out of the activist movement. If you look at the, uh, there is the Bill of Rights, you know, which, which says that the government, uh, can, uh, part of the constitutional system, which First Amendment, uh, it says that the government can't uh, prevent uh, speech, but it doesn't say it can't punish it. So the First Amendment was never understood, in fact, doesn't, a really permit freedom of speech. It says, for example, that the press can, the government can't stop a newspaper from publishing an article, but it can throw them in jail if they did publish it. Now, that's not protection of freedom of speech. And in fact, it wasn't until the 20th century that uh, freedom of speech cases actually reached the high courts. You know, the law is basically what the courts decide, not what's written on paper. And uh, the Supreme Court began to uh, uh, address freedom of speech issues uh, actually during the First World War. And the famous statements supporting freedom of speech were dissents. They were dissenting opinions. And later they were recognized as important. And in fact, if you look at those dissenting opinions, they were nothing to write home about. Uh, the, for example, one of the main ones was uh, during the First World War, the Shank case. It was a I think a Jewish tailor or something who published some uh, pamphlets uh, uh, criticizing the war. Uh, during the war, the, the First World War, uh, it, it became practically fascist in the United States. I mean, you couldn't, the Boston Symphony Orchestra couldn't play uh, Beethoven, let's say. Uh, you couldn't uh, mention anything German. You know, this massive hatred of, it was created of anything loosely related to uh, the German enemy. Uh, Eugene Debs, the major, the leading labor uh, figure in the United States, also a presidential candidate, the Socialist Party candidate, uh, he was thrown in jail for uh, giving a talk in which he uh, uh, urged working, he, in which he told working people, look, this is not your war, it's an imperialist war. Uh, working people don't have a state that they have to serve. Uh, and it, he urged people to think about their constitutional right uh, not to bear arms if they chose not to urge any illegal activity. Uh, he was thrown into jail. And uh, he, he was, uh, after the war, when there was a kind of a general amnesty, he was kept in jail. Uh, he was bitterly hated by the progressives. Uh, Woodrow Wilson hated him particularly and kept him in jail. And uh, this was the atmosphere. In the midst of that, there was a Supreme Court dissent in which uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes made a famous dissent in the Schenck case and said that this, you know, Taylor who published a pamphlet uh, questioning the war shouldn't be, uh, that f f issues of freedom of speech arose, he said. He nevertheless voted with the majority on punishing him. So it was a dissent in the sense that he raised the question of freedom of speech, but nevertheless said that these actions had to be punished. Well, over the years, it sort of broadened a little bit, but then also went backwards in many ways. But it wasn't until the 1960s that there were strong Supreme Court uh, judgments on freedom of speech. And the first major ones came out of the Civil Rights Movement uh, during the, and that's not unusual. In the first major uh, Supreme Court statement uh, affirming freedom of speech was in 1964. It was uh, Times v. Sullivan, if you want to look it up. The, uh, what happened was that uh, the New York Times published an ad 
by uh, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, which uh, condemned a, an Alabama, state of Alabama sheriff, a particularly brutal racist sheriff who was doing all kind of horrible things, and they ran an ad uh, condemning him. State of Alabama sued uh, the New York Times uh, for uh, what's called seditious libel. Uh, practically every country in the world, I suspect Holland too, haven't checked, has a principle of seditious libel. Seditious libel means you cannot assault the state with words. And uh, truth is no defense. Truth makes it a worse crime because then it's an even greater assault. Uh, as far as I know, every country I've looked at still has that law. Britain, Canada, you know, you can check here. Uh, and, and that's like a core attack on freedom of speech. It means the state, you know, the king, or the state, whatever it is, is uh, it cannot be uh, uh, attacked with words. You know? Well, that was, and the United States had it too. It was shot down by the Supreme Court in 1964. So you can assault the state with words. You can criticize the state freely, and that means any state authority. You know? uh, and there were other uh, cases. And finally, in 1969, uh, there was a, uh, the most important case, uh, which uh, said that essentially concluded that speech should be free up to participation in imminent criminal activity. So for example, if you and I go into a store and you have a gun and we're planning to rob it, and I say, shoot, that's not protected speech. But anything kind of up to that should be protected speech. And this is very relevant to the case that you mentioned, because the case in question was the Ku Klux Klan, you know, a vicious, racist, organization carrying out lynching of blacks and so on. And they were the ones who were protected by this, that their speech should be protected up to participation in criminal, in imminent cr uh, criminal acts. As far as I know, that's the most, the strongest protection of freedom of speech that exists uh, anywhere. Actually, it's even beyond what the courts are now willing to accept. Uh, there are also attacks on freedom of speech. So it's, it's by no means a victory that's won forever. Uh, the worst attack is under Obama. Uh, it's a case that you should look up if you're interested, a case that uh, the Obama administration brought to the court. Uh, it was argued by Obama's latest Supreme Court appointment, uh, Kagan, Justice Kagan, and they won. The Obama administration won with the support of the reactionary justices. It's a uh, it, it's a case against a group called the Humanitarian Law Project, which was giving uh, legal advice to uh, a group that's on the government's terrorist list, the PKK, a Turkish group. They were just giving them legal advice, saying, you know, here's the kind of things you can do. Uh, the court decided that, and the Obama administration in, insisted, that even uh, verbal uh, 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 engagement with a group that's on the terrorist list. For example, if you tell them, I think you ought to turn to nonviolent activities, that's criminal. That's material support for terrorism. And uh, uh, that's a real attack on freedom of speech, a major attack. I mean, for example, I could be charged. Jimmy Carter could be charged. Plenty of people could be charged. Anyone who approach involved in any way with a group that the government calls terrorist, uh, any, anything you do, like tell them to keep the nonviolent activities or say, here are your rights or whatever, that's criminal. That's a major assault on freedom of speech, and that's Obama. And what makes it worse and isn't even discussed is that the terrorist list itself is a, you know, utterly illegitimate by any standards of the last couple of centuries. I mean, the government just says, this is, you're on the terrorist list. Nothing you can do about it. And uh, uh, no judicial review, no evidence, uh, no nothing. Just the government says, you're on the terrorist list. And the way it's used is like mind boggling. So for example, in 1982, the Reagan administration uh, wanted to provide uh, aid to their friend Saddam Hussein. 
and Iraq was on the terrorist list. So they took Iraq off the terrorist list so they could provide Saddam with aid, and there was a gap on the terrorist list, so they put Cuba in. Uh, you know, Cuba had just been subjected to years of intensive terror. Okay, so they're on the terrorist list. Saddam Hussein is off it. It's totally arbitrary. Uh, and the unconstrained acts of um, state terror, basically. But if you speak to them and give them advice or say anything, that's a crime. So that's pretty, pretty strong. This is the United States, which is the standard bearer for freedom of speech. It's constantly under attack. Uh, England is in many ways worse. Uh, in England, the attack on freedom of speech comes from the, uh, uh, the libel laws. There are scandalous libel laws in England. Uh, in most countries, in the United States at least, probably here, if, uh, say, you sue me for libel, you have to prove that I libeled you. In England, I have to prove that I didn't libel you. Uh, that sets up a standard of proof which is almost unreachable. And in cases where, uh, I'll take one real case, uh, a, a small newspaper in England, about three people, uh, published uh, an expose of claims made by uh, ITV, you know, this huge uh, television uh, media uh, conglomerate. And they may have been right, they may have been wrong, but we can debate it. But uh, anyway, they, they published something challenging claims made by ITV. ITV sued them for libel. Three people who, you know what it's like to run a small left newspaper, uh, they didn't have the resources to deal with the you know, legal teams and endless resources of a major corporation. So they basically had to abandon the case and they were uh, um, sentenced under the libel laws, put out of business. Interestingly, the, the left journalists in, the, in England, like the ones who wrote for The Guardian, were very ecstatic about this. They thought it was great. They silenced uh, somebody who said That's something they didn't like. To, uh, we have to move on to the next question, I guess. So I should wrap this up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you know, that's uh, uh, these are the ways uh, uh, freedom, of, uh, freedom of speech is, uh, assaults on freedom of speech actually take place. Going back to your question, uh, I don't think the way to deal with neo-fascist groups is to try to shut them up forcefully. You should try to win the argument. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable to see how it works. So take, say, Holocaust denial. Uh, in a lot of Europe, uh, Holocaust denial is a crime. In France, it's a, uh, there are laws against it. You can't do it. Uh, in the United States, it's not a crime. Uh, the, the consequence is that in the United States, Holocaust denial is unknown. There's plenty of it. You know, there's professors, at, uh, tenured professors at universities who have published books uh, denying the Holocaust. Nobody pays any attention to them. And it's ridiculous. I forget about it. It's just crazy business. In France and a lot of Europe, it's all over the front pages. A uh, ton of publicity. You know, some guy somewhere does some marginal thing. Uh, everybody knows about it. Yeah, it's, it's a way of giving publicity to Holocaust denial. Uh, if you treat it the sensible way, it's, it's about like somebody claiming the earth is flat. Okay, forget it. It has no, no impact. Uh, I, I just don't think it's even tactically the right way to deal with, uh, uh, say, neo-fascist groups. And it does give them an argument. As you said, they can claim freedom of speech, which is a value we ought to uphold. So we should uphold it and then win the argument.